here. Um, oh, sorry, got to do my webcam thing. There we are. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, welcome to another one in our series of 10. We're going to be talking about communication today. I think we're at our sixth entry. Um, next time we're going to be talking about risk, which is a, which is a very fun topic. And um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. So welcome everyone who's joining us out there today. Some quick logistics as we get started. As always, your host, myself, David Donaldson, and we've got uh, Jessica on support. So if you have any sound technology issues, uh, please just pop into the um, the chat window and just, just fire in a quick note there, and Jessica will do her best to sort it out. As always, we are recording these sessions, so they will be available later. Uh, at the top of your screen, you do have a little hand waving guy there that you can click on. You've got a bunch of options. You can raise your hand. You can agree, disagree, uh, particularly speak louder, speak softer, speed up, slow down, that kind of stuff. Um, there's always the chat window. We leave that open and active through the uh, whole session so that you can pop quote notes and questions and comments in there. See, we've already got our first comment from Mark. Love the music. Thanks. Yeah, when we got our, our new software, I was uh, I was looking forward to being able to do the on hold music, and I finally had some time to do that. So uh, thank you, Mozart, for sharing your beautiful music with us. And of course, as always, we do accept applause. All right. So we're going to start off right out of the gate this morning with... Um, or this afternoon, with, with a quick question for you. And I want to know from you, what key learning or relearning nugget do you want to get out of today? Now, this is a, a it is a pre-done uh, session. Uh, I do have some flexibility, but I really want to hear from you guys. What do you want to get out of today? So just pop into the, the question box down the bottom there and type in uh, what you want to get out of today. So seeing some great um, great uh, items popping in here, some new ideas from Mark, uh, from Diane. I love this one, how to be heard. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll, we'll talk about some, some things around that. Best way to communicate with the team, um, how to be understood. Interesting, Chantel. So, you know, taking uh, Diane's comment around how to be heard and then sort of expanding on that, not only being heard but being understood. Uh, keywords or phrases to avoid from Laura. Yeah, sometimes it feels a little bit like a minefield out there, doesn't it? Um, from David, best way to get my point across, communication, senior execs, love it, yeah, so we're often communicating to people at different levels than us, um, you know, communicating up as well as communicating uh, down that corporate ladder. Uh, more effective communication techniques, how to achieve understanding, illicit collaboration, I'm loving that, some quick tips, um, messaging to a diverse audience, um, how to handle uh, combative conversations, wow, we can, you know what, uh, Mailing, we can just do a whole session on that alone, then maybe that would be a good one for our coming up. We've actually started that conversation in in house around um, around uh, you know what what's going to be next. Uh, another one from Diane. How do you get people to answer the question asked? Love that one, Diane. Um, quick little side note, Diane. I'm going to recommend you to a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, again, Thinking Fast and Slow, and it is. Um, it is by Daniel Kahneman, and it, it, it actually addresses that question as part of it. So book recommendation, and what I'll do is I'll just pop it into the, the chat window. Um, thinking fast and slow. If you just Google that, you'll find it. Uh, thinking fast. Oh, my typing skills are. There we go. OK. Um, how to deal with passive aggressive conversation. Oh, there's another toughie. Uh, how to handle, how to get people to answer the question asked. Uh, some quick tips. Beautiful. Loving this. Um, now, I'm just going to pop us right into our next question. And how can asking you this question improve communication? So I started today by asking you a question and, and asked you to tell me what you wanted. How is this going to help improve communication? Mm, I think I got you all thinking on that one. All 
Okay. Encourage feedback from David. Yes, totally agree. Um, keeping calm and collective. Drew, I'm not really understanding what you're what you're meaning there. If you could elaborate on that a little bit. Um, by getting us to think about this topic. Absolutely, Norman, and that is actually one of the main reasons we do this. We often pose this question at the beginning of our of our training sessions because um, it does help you think about the topic in question, which which puts your mind in that alignment, and it, it kind of puts your mind into almost a search mode, so you're, you're more receptive. Uh, makes me think before I speak. Yep, liking that. Listening skills, getting everyone thinking. Uh, you understand what I am looking for in this conversation from Laura. Bang on. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's you know what we need and want. Uh, learn how to manage uh, what frustrates us. And the reason that I pose this question out there, and, and you know, I know we do have limited two-way communication um, in these webinars, and really when we look at it, um, you know, we do have some really good, capable, uh, virtual technologies for having conversations, having communications virtually, you know, and whether that's just on audio, whether that's on text, or including on video. Um, when you get to, you know, when you've got a, you know, a couple hundred people on one side and one person on the other, it tends to become much more of a of a one-way conversation. And the inspiration behind this actually came from a good friend of mine, Oliver. Um, and having lunch with him earlier this week, we kind of do this around Christmas time every year. We get together for lunch and reconnect. And uh, he, amongst other things, teaches and facilitates and coaches around um, the, the topic of negotiation and conflict management and those sort of topics. And over lunch, we were chatting, and I thought, you know, here's a really important communication aspect, especially when we're dealing in those high emotional situations. So I asked him about his experience from that. And he related a, a really good story um, from when he was coaching. And he had a, a, it was a police officer he was working with, a junior police officer who was taking his negotiation session. And he was working with them. And there was a, a senior police officer uh, as part of the whole uh, environment in the setup. And she said, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, let's, let's hear from your associate who's, who's been at this a while. And she said, the biggest thing is to listen, um, number one. And listening is, is the most important element of communication. So, you know, we look at, you know, what's important here? Well, communication, it's the most important tool you have as a project manager. 80, 90% of what you're going to do is communicate. And if you don't have good, well-developed communication skills, you're going to be very challenged as, as a project manager. And listening is the most important part of communication. Um, as my mother always used to say, you've got two ears and one mouth. Excuse me. Um, You've got two ears and one mouth. Use them in that ratio. And the reality is, when we talk in terms of communication, at least especially for me, being that that you know A plus capital A type personality, for me it's all about transmitting and let me tell you what I know and all this kind of stuff. And I, I've learned over the years and it takes some discipline. You know what? It's a lot more effective when you stop and listen. Um, there's a, a great VJ Verma quote, um, which is uh, when when Listeners listen, talkers talk. And if you want to get information out of someone, the best thing you can do is shut up. This is, you know, just just be quiet, let them, you know, ask a couple probing questions and then open the door and give it space. Um, and this is why I wanted to start off our session today with, with that question. And really it's about not only now I'm better positioned and enabled to, you know, hear what you need and, and adjust to that, but you're also more tuned in. Um, and this concept, uh, we're going to explore a little bit later. But just before we do, I want to just do a quick exercise in communication. So take a blank piece of paper. I'm going to give you very specific instructions here. On this blank piece of paper, I want you to draw a vertical line. Then you're going to draw a horizontal line that intersects the vertical line at exactly 90 degrees. I'm being very specific, exactly 90 degrees. Then you're going to draw a third line uh, at a 45 degree angle, and I want it to intersect both the vertical and the horizontal lines. Okay, so I'll just give you a, a couple moments to do that. Here's what I was asking you to draw. <laughs> now, having done this in class a few times, you get some kind of, you know, stuff all over the place. And I didn't even start with squiggly lines. Um, <laughs> there was nothing in there that said draw a straight line. So, you know, all of these images that I just popped up here meet 
that goal, they have a vertical line, they have a 90 degree intersecting line, they have a 45 degree line that intersects both. And really what I was asking you to draw was a, a, was a right angle uh, triangle. So there are times when, you know, a picture says a thousand words. If you're working in something very, um, in more of a physical space, if you're working in something, um, you know, that, that, that is going to be graphical, draw it. Right? And this is where, like in construction, we actually, PMs actually have a huge advantage here because they work off of drawings. It's like if it's not on the drawing, I don't build it. Now, we can still do that in, in the corporate world. We can still use drawings. We can still use images. We can still use uh, this way of conveying our information. So visual is a huge element of communication. Our visual cortex takes something like 50% of all of our senses. So it, you know, visual trumps all other senses. Um, if, if you've ever been to the the IMAX theater, and I remember when they first came out, this was a huge deal because you'd be sitting there watching this giant screen just fills your entire field of view, and you know you're flying through space or whatever, and and the whole image does one of these and tilts, and you just you feel like the whole the whole theater is just tilting to the side. Um, of course, you close your eyes, you immediately you know you're upright and and straight up. Um, but you know, visual is a huge element of communication. So you know what? Let's leverage it. This is why things like prototypes and and people seeing it on screen and you know you're you're trying to describe something, and you know people are going, oh, okay, well, I'm not really getting it. And then you draw a quick picture and it's like, boom, got it, right? Um, when I did work in the IT world, I would often create a prototype, and it wasn't about creating something that functioned. It was about creating something that um, you could see that you could um, you know, take a look at and sort of get a comfort level that you, you could see what it's going to look like. So I'm going to ask the next question. So this is going to be a poll. Which is more compelling, relevant information or interesting information? And let's just pop over into the poll here. So which is more compelling as a form of communication, something that is relevant to you or something that is We're getting some very interesting responses to this uh, relevant poll question that I'm asking. Sorry for the pun. Um, we'll give it a, a few more seconds, and then we'll broadcast our results. I'm actually a little surprised at these results. This is interesting. OK. I've got a nice even numbers there, so I'm going to end the poll here, and we'll broadcast the results. So 58% said that interesting was more compelling than relevant. Wow, that is really surprising. Um, yeah, oh man, how do we deal with that one? Um, the reality, folks, is the the relevant info is what we're going to pay attention to. Um, sorry, I'm just going to back up one there. I forgot we go straight into the next poll. Um, relevant information is what we're going to pay attention to. Now, I want you to think about a scenario where you're in a training class and the instructor goes off on these tangents because it's interesting, right? It's kind of interesting, but... Um, you know, it's not really going to be that compelling. And and the keyword here is compelling. Now, Rich posted a great question here. Rel relevant information by its nature is interesting. No, I totally agree. It becomes interesting, and here's why it's interesting. We are survival beings. We are programmed. We're designed to survive. And if it's not relevant to us, our brain naturally says, get rid of it, OK? Because if it's relevant, that's what's going to keep us alive, right? So yes, we do have a built-in mechanism that things that are relevant to us become interesting, right? So so by their sheer nature, yes, you're right. So I'm sure some of you said, well, I find that interesting, and the, and the motivation behind it is it's relevant. Uh, what I'm talking about is in un, the trivial facts, the, the, the interesting but not relevant to you type stuff. And some of that, you know, it is a little bit compelling, but the reality is, if you want someone to truly pay attention, make it relevant to them, OK? Um, and we're, get, we're going to come back to that in a few seconds. Now, as to sort of build on that, ex here's, here's a quick question for you. And let's just pop this poll open here. I think we're into poll two now. There we are. Um, there we go. Cool. And it is open. Good. Um, explaining the organizational and community benefits of a change 
is a compelling communication strategy. So I want you to think about a change that's coming out. Um, your frontline staff, I'm going to put this into a very specific context here. You can always change your vote if you need to. Um, your frontline staff, this change is coming out and we're explaining the organizational benefits. It's going to increase market share. Uh, it's going to make the, you know, the community like us better, you know, things like that. Okay, and remember your frontline staff on this scenario. So really try to put yourself in, in their shoes. All right, we'll give it a, a couple more minutes. <clears throat> Okay, let's cap her off there and let's take a look at our results. And not surprising here, 78% of the folks said, yes, this is a true compelling st strategy. Um, oh, sorry guys, I hate to hate to, to do this. The 21.5%, the you guys, you got it. Um, we need to be cautious because we're often working in the mid to higher levels of organizations as PMs and we're looking at, you know, what are the organizational benefits? But here's the thing, you get a frontline staff person, they're going to be thinking about how does this impact me? How does this make my job easier or harder? And we often, we sometimes inadvertently create resistance to our projects um, by really, you know, creating these statements around the benefits of a, um, of, of a project or a change in doing it in ways that really make sense to people at a, at a different level and, and this is what they're going to be hearing blah 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 right they want to know what's in it for them we need to adjust our message so when we're meeting with senior management or when we're meeting with division leaders um, then yes how this is going to benefit the organization totally what's in it for them because it's tied back to their their you know performance goals etc but when you start getting down to those front level staff, when you're talking about, you know, the, the tellers in the bank, you're talking about the, the um, you know, customer service reps who are, who are on the phone talking to customers, when you got the, the field staff who are doing the installations of the products and stuff like that, yeah, not so much. They want to know what's in it for them. And this, folks, is really, really key. Um, I live and breathe by this because when I, when I tune into what's in it for them, that's when people really start to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you, I'm paying attention. Um, so WIIFM, some people refer to it as WIFM. I like to call it WIIFM radio station. Are you tuned in? And, you know, when you, when you figure out what's relevant to your audience and then you put that up there, um, that will become interesting immediately, okay? So, you know, you've got... Um, You've got a, a project you're trying to run. You're trying to get people to engage. We're all we're constantly asking this question: How do I get people to engage? How do I get people to participate? How do I get people, you know, wanting to be there? Answer this question: What's in it for them? The more effectively you answer that, the more people are going to be: I want to be there. I'm here. I'm in. You know, what can I do? Um, Interesting fact, you know, I'm a, I'm a frontline staffer in a large organization. I get, you know, 80,000 people worldwide, and I'm doing my job. I don't have any staff re reporting to me, but, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with some frontline customers, and you're telling me about this new project and how it's going to increase our market share, and, and we're going to increase our, you know, penetration into this market, and, and you know, we're going to increase, uh, you know, share prices, and we're going to, you know, have better profitability. I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, there's a little tiny, tiny bit of what's in it for me there that I keep my job. You know, the company is profitable, but the reality is, you know what? You you turn that around and turn it into it is going to change your life because you're now going to be able to get your job done faster and easier, and you're going to be able to service your clients better. And and all those barriers that you've been complaining about for the past three years, we're going to take half of them away. Now all of a sudden, I'm going okay. This now I'm now I'm really listening, all right? And there, there's a great example of this, and um, I, I meant to research this ahead of time. Apologies, um, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was Steve Jobs. He was he was really trying to recruit um, when he was first starting, and and the gentleman he was recruiting, um, I'm really embarrassed now. I've forgotten his name. It just jumped out of my head. But he was the head of PepsiCo. He was the head of Pepsi, and and basically he said the fun, the thing that made him leave because here he's you know this, he was a C level. Uh, you know, executive at this huge organization, and we're going to go to a startup out of this guy's garage. And he said, "Do you want to keep selling sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to make a difference in the world?" You know, 
and and you look at that and go, wow, there's there's really what's in it for me, you know. So we want a nice, good, compelling statement, but it's it's got to be really, you know, hitting that that WIIFM. All right. So we've been talking around this topic a little bit, and I, I want to now define it. How do you define effective communication? So I'm just going to pop into the uh, question box here. How do you define effective communication? All right, so let's take a look at what we're getting here from Diane. When you understand and you are understood. Ooh, I like that. So it's in both directions. Beautiful call to action from Amy. Uh, it's concise and precise from Setter. Totally agree. But that's really kind of more of how we do it, right? Um, so you're just scrolling off the screen here so fast. I've got so many coming in. This is great. Um, get the point. It's driven home from Carol Ann. Concise, precise. Uh, openness. Again, how we go about doing that. Um, when you walk away with understanding, I'm liking that one from, from Julie, uh, it includes feedback, Ryan. Yes, huge important piece. We've got to have that feedback loop. Uh, message being clearly understood. So yeah, a lot of things around you know, being understood and messages being received. The right people are understanding the message from Doug. Love that one. Yeah, because we, you know, we, we may get the message across, but we're getting across to the right people. Both parties not only understand what is said, but what needs to get done to get us to where we need to go. Ooh, that's a nice one, Laura. I'm liking that. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of comments around uh, understanding, a clear message uh, from Diane, open dialogue. Totally agreeing with all this stuff. This is you know, some really good stuff here. Um, oh, thank you, Thomas. CEO was John Scully <laughs> for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Um, now, here's my take on effective communication. and. I was walking through Union on uh, on uh, Union Station here in Toronto on um, oh goodness what day was that? I think it was on Tuesday, and I walked past this sign and I thought oh this is perfect for my webinar. I'm going to stop and take a picture of this. So as as if you pass through Union Station in the past year or so, you'll know it's under major construction. So here's a sign I walked by, and there's actually two of them, exactly the same signs, you know, about a, not even a meter apart. So it's like okay, why do we need two here? But um, washroom closed. Please use washroom in West Wing street level. Now, I've been passing through Union for 20 odd years, and if you said to me, if you stopped me in the middle of Union somewhere and said, you know, where's the West Wing? I'd be like, the West what? Um, now, I've, I've actually got a pretty good idea of where North, South, East, West is. Uh, so I could kind of direct you in which, you know, I could kind of point you which way is West, but the West Wing, yeah, I'm not really, now that's just not, not really effective communication, well, for me anyways. So, you know, I kind of looked at that, snapped a picture, and thought, this is a really good, um, you know, example, because here we want to have some communication. Now, my take on effective communication is effective communication creates the desired action, okay? Um, there's lots of ways we can do that, things around, you know, being heard, having feedback loops, all that kind of stuff, and we do tend to focus on the how a lot, which is really good, but let's not lose sight of, of what true effective communication is which is you get the desired action. And, and the desired action for this sign is that someone would, who walked to this point in the station where there used to be a washroom would then turn in the appropriate direction left or right and walk in that direction towards the currently open washroom. So let's just edit the sign a little bit and okay I did not editing it was actually there the whole time but yeah we take a look at that you know we could ditch the west wing piece and just say washroom closed, please use other washroom and just have that arrow pointing. I mean, think about how effective that communication is. Washroom this way, boom, arrow, done. Um, the street level I do find useful because where the sign was, you're actually in the lower level and the arrow is pointing, which would, if you followed it directly, it would, you know, straight up the ramp there. Um, so that, that part actually makes sense. Now, I kind of like that. But, you know, to me, the arrow really makes sense. Now, here's what happened. I'm walking through Union. I glance off to my right, and I see this washroom closed. Please use West Wing washroom, blah, blah, blah. And I see that and think, wow, how ineffective is that? Because now I'm in my mindset of, of this whole communication webinar. I thought, how ineffective is that? 
and then you know a couple more meters down the this temporary fence is the second sign and there's that arrow and I thought there it is now it's effective um, so I snapped a picture of it yeah you know we want to be really asking ourselves you know are we getting that result and that to me is the gold standard of effective communication yes it needs to be clear it needs to be concise it needs to be compelling and the compelling piece is what's going to you know drive us to action right and that's why I say interesting information yes it is interesting and I may listen to it but you know am I going to act on it if it's interesting not so much if it's relevant then yeah I am okay um, so you know we've got a lot of tools around doing that and I'm just gonna tie all of this back now to last month's webinar last month we were talking about the project team in HR and one of the fundamental tenets we put out there was a team is like a garden it needs constant tending well the question now is how do you tend to a garden well you tend to them by communicating clear consistent compelling um, you know that's why we say project managers 90% of what you're gonna do is communicate 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 and it feels like you're gonna be a broken record right because you're, you're often saying the same thing over and over and over again but let's not forget sometimes when you're saying this these folks are hearing it for the first time and we put this into the context of change management and think about you're working on the project you're working on the back end you're working on all the details and you've had time to think through this you may have known about this for months now and you've you sat down with the team you've discussed it you looked at it from different angles you have slept on it you've, you've you know had those epiphanies in the middle of the night um, you know you've gone through all that process your team may be hearing some of this stuff for the first time and it may not be landing um, we're also constantly competing with a deluge of information um, there's a Huffington Post study last year that said people are checking their cell phones about once every seven minutes um, there are people who are surveyed that said you know what they would be more upset with losing their phone than losing their their spouse like oh my god people <laughs> but we get we get just this deluge of information so we need to make our communication clear consistent compelling it needs to be consistent so they hear it over and over again now this ties into one of uh, you know those brain science things where if we hear the same thing enough times our brain starts to say hey this is important I, I need to make note of this right so if I'm if I'm constantly telling you the same thing you know and I tell you one two three four you know ten times whatever um, subconsciously your brain is gonna say I've heard this ten times I'm thinking this might be important All right so one of the ways to increase the acceptance of a message and and sales people have known this for many years they repeat it over and over and over again right um, all right so with that in mind how frequently do you think you need to um, communicate your change initiative all right so let's just pop into our poll here and I think it's this one oops wrong one let me just get into the right one there we are how many times how frequently should you be communicating your change initiative give her a few more moments getting lots of responses All right, give it a couple more seconds here. Let's uh, close the poll. This is one of those cases where more is better. Um, now, we also kind of want to temper that a little bit. Um, while we were having this conversation, Julia popped into the chat and she said, I find most members are working on multiple projects. Totally agree, Julia. Um, remember there, there was a lady that I used to work with, Heather, fantastic lady. and. Uh, when I left the organization, I've been there seven years. When I left, uh, we went for a, a nice little lunch to say, you know, so long, farewell. And um, I remember asking her how many projects she was working on. She was a PM, um, 
And and she said twenty. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's that's not really effective. All right. So um, what we're looking at here, seven to fifteen times, and and this comes out of John Cotter's work. Um, there's multiple other studies that show you want to be communicating this more frequently uh, than less. Uh, we do it once. Um, the cognitive biases aren't going to really register it as being that important because they've only seen it once versus seeing it multiple times. And then we layer that with the constant, um, um, we layer that with the constant, you know, deluge of other information. We layer that with the constant, it's, um, you know, we got so much stuff going on that, you know, it can get lost in the maelstrom. Now, Doug, great comment here, thinking that if I'm an effective communicator, once should be enough. Keep in mind, Doug, that you're only half of the equation. So no matter how effective you are and, and you do all the right things, you know, what's happening on the other side of that fence, right? What's happening to the other side there? And to just put that into a quick context for you, I want you to think about a time in your life when um, you had uh, a loved one who was sick, okay? So whether that's your spouse, your child, perhaps a family member, um, you know, so maybe you get up in the morning, you're, you're doing your thing, you're preparing to go to work, you, you get a text from your sister, you know, whatever that looks like. How focused are you? How, when you get to work that day, how much are you thinking about your job, right? How much are you, how much are you now thinking about, you know, what's going on, right? So I, I had an experience like this one time. I was working in Vancouver. I was on a uh, four-day uh, training session out there for a client. And um, it was in the morning of, of the fourth day of the last day. And um, um, it was in the morning of the last day. And um, I got this odd message from my sister-in-law. And my sister-in-law sent me a note about, um, we, we used to volunteer together on a, on a summer camp. And she says, oh, by the way, could you send me the mailing list, blah, 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 you know, some usual mundane uh, stuff. And then she said, and sorry to hear about Dolores let me know if there's anything we can do. Now, Dolores is my wife, and I'm going, hold on, what? Because <laughs> last I chatted with her, which was the night before, right, because we got that whole time difference thing, uh, everything was fine. And so I'm thinking, okay, so I grab the phone and I try phoning, and there's no answer. And after leaving a couple messages and trying phoning, my 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 kind of, you know, uh, alarm bells are going off here, and and I email back, and there's no response there. I'm like, what are you talking about? And stuff. So I finally get a hold of her, and what had happened was she'd had a, a severe gallbladder attack and ended up being rushed to hospital, and they wanted to do, like, emergency surgery. Um, I can tell you at that point, there is, um, there is, you know, I am not thinking about work. I mean, relevancy and, and there's lots of lots and lots of uh, you know examples of this kind of stuff now um, just going to address these these two questions that have popped in because when I first heard this statistic seven to fifteen times I'm, I'm kind of with you a little bit on this rich getting that same message over and over again uh, it starts to become a little bit annoying um, you're going to do this to what makes sense but I can almost guarantee you once is not sufficient okay and you know, keep in mind that it's that there's going to be details that are lost. Um, you know, you can't just do a single communication, especially in something that's a little bit more complex. There needs to be some layering there, right? We need to, we need to hear about this a few times. The other aspect to that too is, especially the timeline, uh, we want to keep it top of mind. Now, to Sheila's comment, doesn't it depend upon the relevance of the change to your audience? Yes, it does, absolutely. Because the more relevant your messaging is, the less you're going to need to repeat it over and over again, and the more it's going to land, and the more it's going to be received and processed, right? Because here's the thing: every piece of message, every piece of information that comes in to our brains, uh, says, we simply say a very simple question: Is this relevant to me? Can I throw it away, or is it relevant to me? Can I, can I, you know, deal with that? Um, and with the deluge of information that we have, you know, we get into that kind of a mode of asking ourselves. Can I ignore this, or do I need to deal with this, right? And we're just answering the, asking a very simple question around, is it relevant to me? Now, the more we can put the message relevant to the recipient, and that's the key here, the recipient, not the transmitter, um, the more it's going to land, and the less I'm going to have to, to repeat and repeat and repeat, right? Um, but once, yeah, not not maybe, maybe that. And 
we're also, and thank you, Norman. Uh, yeah, we're not talking the same day here, right? I'm talking about over time. I'm talking about, um, you know, what we're going to roll out this new system. Uh, you know, it needs to be communicated multiple times, you know, giving the heads up, here's an update on the progress, and, you know, those kinds of things. So I'm not talking about, you know, I'm going to send you seven, eight, ten emails on the one day. No, not at all. So, okay. Now, we talked about effective communication. And I keep, my, my wife sent me this, this fabulous little story a little while back. It was one of those ones that popped around the, you know, Facebook internet thing. Um, and I thought, I'm going to use this because this is just brilliant. Now, I'm going to put this in the context of effective communication is about getting results. It's about desired action. So here's the scenario. This is from a, a private school in Washington. Right? They faced a little bit of a problem. 12-year-old girls were beginning to use lipstick. Yeah, that's fine. They would put it on in the bathroom, and then they would kiss the mirror, leaving a little, you know, a little lip print on the mirror. And they would, every night, maintenance would clean the mirrors, and every day the, the girls would come back, and they would do the same thing over and over again. So this became a bit of an issue because you know, maintenance is having to do this extra cleaning, and et cetera, et cetera. So the principal finally decided they had to do something. Right? So you think, okay, well, what would you do if you're in her situation? Oh, you probably talk to the people, maybe um, talk about how it's costing money, uh, it's extra work for the janitor, that kind of stuff. Well, here's what she did do. She called the girls and the custodian into the bathroom. She explained these lip prints are a major problem. Then, and here's the key thing, and I love this piece. Then she asked the custodian to demonstrate how much work it is to clean the mirrors. So he took out a squeegee, dipped it in the toilet, and cleaned the mirror. Now, I wish I had the camera over there because Jess has just given me this awesome reaction. <laughs> so I can imagine that everyone, especially the ladies in the audience today, are just kind of going, oh my god. Yeah, you can guess what the reaction was, right? The, the practice stopped overnight, right? Never returned. Um, you know, here's effective communication. I'm, I'm guessing that she didn't need to uh, do this uh, 7 to 15 times. Um, but it's like instant reaction. But here's the, you know, it's extremely relevant. It's extremely impactful, right, compelling uh, messaging. So, you know, great story. I just absolutely love that one. All right. So we're going to pop open our next poll here. And uh, when you're doing your communication, which is more important, knowing all there is to know about the change before communicating it, so all those all those nitty-gritty details, or being passionate about what you're communicating, or you know what, it doesn't really matter. Okay, let's take a look at these results. I'm just going to end this poll. Fairly common response here, 41% saying knowing uh, the details is important, 41% say, or 47, excuse me, saying passionate, and then 11% uh, saying neither. Um, the research shows, you know what, we've got to be passionate about it. Yes, we do need to know the details, but not every single detail, not knowing all the, the, the subtle details. So we've got to find that balance, but what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not, we're not missing that passion. Um, the thing that will really come across to me and, and to, to the recipient there is how you feel about it. If you are passionate about your message, things are going to land um, a little bit better. I don't know about you, but you, know, you get into those, um, you know what, I don't really care about this. Well, hey, if you don't care, why should I care? Right, so think about the, the kind of sub-message that you're sending there. Um, you know, I find I, you, know, you get someone who's really passionate about that. They haven't got all the details worked out yet. You know, we can look up the details. We can look up the information. Um, but you know, it's, the, it's that passionate rally cry that's going to that's gonna really cause us to action. And I, and I really go back again to that definition of uh, you know, what is effective communication, and it's about getting that um, getting that call to action and getting getting people to to, to react and behave uh, or eliciting that behavior so let's take all of this stuff now and let's boil it down and, and put it into the context of communicating with a project and I've used this slide before um, we started with the 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 scope and the what's in and what's out uh, you know feeding into the work breakdown structure and the the schedule et cetera et cetera et cetera 
and really everywhere you see one of these arrows it's representing communication. Um, we need to communicate with the team what's going on. We need to communicate between the scope definitions and the scheduling and the costing and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, we just see tons and tons of communication happening here, uh, you know, all over the place and just, just flowing in every direction. And then you open up PMBOK and you look at the processes and there's, there's three of them. And one of them is about planning. It's like, what the heck? Well, in the fourth edition of PMBOK, there was actually five processes in communication. And then in the, in the fifth, they, they shortened it to three. Now, the other two actually moved. They went over to, to stakeholders, which we'll be talking about in a couple months. Um, but here's the thing. PMI recognized that the communication that they were talking about was too technical. It was about, you know, uh, status reporting and, you know, things like this. So they got rid of, you know, distribute the status reports and they said manage communication because what we don't want to do is is focus down in on just the technical communications we want to think about the bigger larger communications that are going on there um, so even though there's only three processes they're extremely broad so plan communication management how am I going to do this what am I going to do how am I going to go about doing that and much like everything in in project planning you're going to have you know sort of that framework or core of what you're going to do and then there's going to be a whole bunch of other stuff that sort of happens ad hoc and along the way right um, manage that communication you know sending those messages having those conversations uh, publishing those reports you know whatever that looks like uh, and then and then control communications and that's really asking that simple question is it working am I making a difference here am I getting the action that uh, I desire. We're going to focus in on, on managing control. Now, manage communications purpose here, get the message out. So when I asked that first question around, you know, what do you want to get out of here? It's like, well, how do I, how do I, how am I heard? How am I, um, you know, going to get that message across? How can I be understood clearly? A lot of the answers came back very much from the receiver's perspective. So there's a, there's a simple concept here that I really want to highlight, which is communication is a two-way process. It's a responsibility of both the sender and the receiver. So did a quick Google of sender receiver and came up with this one here. And you know, here's that message mid-flight. So the sender has launched it. There needs to be a receiver over there to complete the pass. Because otherwise, you know, we missed. It didn't work, right? We need both sides. And and there's lots of other stuff happening in between that could cause that um, that transmission, that receipt to fail. So we want to be thinking about that. Who is our receiver? How are we getting it to them? And what are the barriers that we have to cross uh, while, while that you know, message is effectively in flight? And then how do we even know that it was received? Right? Can, we, can we even see that receiver? So think about planning. How can we do this better? Well, we can start by doing a little bit of planning. And notice the first item here. Think through what you wish to accomplish, a.k.a. what are the objectives. Too many times I see communication models that say the first thing you should look at is the audience. Who's your recipient? No. First thing you should be looking at is what is your objective? What's the purpose of this communication? If you can't clearly articulate that, there's a problem. Okay, so let's figure out the what. You know, what action are we trying to elicit? What information are we trying to get across? But more importantly, what is the purpose of this? Uh, do we want a decision back? Do we want a certain action back? Is this about uh, keeping people in the loop so that they know what's coming, so that we're preparing and laying the groundwork to enable the action down the road? You know, what does all that look like, right? Then we start thinking about our audience. And notice it says appeal to the interests of those affected. This is the WIIFM. What's in it for me? Now, I'm going to take that messaging and I'm going to adjust it. So let's think about the messaging that we have. We're working on a project. We want to send some messages up the food chain, talk to our sponsors, talk to senior management. It's a different message uh, than what we're going to be sending down the food chain to frontline staff who are going to be impacted by this project. Um, it's a different what's in it for them message. Now, that difference may be relatively subtle, but we need to make sure that we're aligning it to their needs, right? Then determine the way you will communicate. Is this a casual conversation? Is this a, a formal conversation? Uh, you know, what does that look like? Perhaps it's, it's just an email, that sort of thing. Um, 
So uh, just recently got a new boss, uh, Don. He started, what, not even two weeks ago, I think. And um, really happy to have him on board, by the way. He's a great guy so far. So far. Um, so I'm looking at that going, OK, I'm going to have my first meeting with him. And my first thought was, what are my objectives, right? Well, it's to establish our relationship, to to kind of set a baseline, you know, these sorts of things. I'm thinking, how am I going to do that, right? And so I said, you know what? I emailed Don. I said, hey, let's let's go for lunch. Let's let's go meet and get to know each other a little bit, right? Um, so we think about, you know, what are the objectives? Who's the audience? And then how are we going to communicate with them? What's the most effective method? And sometimes that most effective method is a combination because we're going to, you know, have that conversation, but then we're also going to, um, you know, maybe back that up with some, you know, documentation, you know, that kind of thing. So you may have the conversation around how things are going, but then let's let's give you the status report later. And I love these last two bullets on this slide, which is really kind of the main reason why I, I grabbed this. Give playback on the way others communicate and get playback on what you communicate. If I'm ever in the opportunity where I have an associate in the room, um, so for example, we're going into a uh, you know an important strategic meeting with a client. We're going to be talking about some certain things. We want to you know sort of get some action in, in in whatever that looks like. And you know it's you know Siobhan and I are going in to meet with this client, that kind of thing. We'll do a debrief afterwards and have a quick chat and say you know how did that go. You know, did this work for for us? And you know, here's what you did well. Here's where we can improve. You know, things like this. Now, here's the keys to this. First of all, you have to ask. And when I say give playback on the way others communicate, you need to ask permission. Okay. Um, and as the person being asked, it's okay to say not right now. Um, and then the other key to it that I find is is let the person know ahead of time that you want feedback. Um, I find that works really well. So you're doing that big presentation to your sponsor, to your senior management. Um, you know, you're running that status meeting. Uh, you know, maybe you're you're doing the announcement for the new, uh, you know, the Widget Master 2000 that you're rolling out, etc. You've done all your planning. You've stressed on the slides. You've redone them 28 times. You know, you've practiced in front of a mirror. You've done all your stuff, right? If you can get someone in the room. Who can who can just you know be that objective observer and 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 see how that's going, right? What does that look like? Because um, we have our own opinions and our own viewpoints. We want to see you know what it is from the other side. You know what does that look like? So want to just touch on writing skills, um, especially in today's world of uh, virtual teams. We're often communicating a lot with writing, um, you know, and I'm guilty as charged. We often get into this whole, you know, you write like you talk. Um, we we tend to use acronyms and short forms, and grammar is just going out the window. Um, again, guilty as charged. Um, so we look at writing skills, and you think about, you know, what are you writing? It, you know, reports, plans, proposals, standards, etc. And I just love this. The main aim of business writing is it should be understood clearly when read quickly. And that, that's from B.J. Verma. He's, he's a, a really good author around um, uh, HR and communication and things. So it should be well planned. It should be simple. It should be clear. It should be correct uh, or clear and should be direct. Um, I worked with a, a gentleman years ago. I'll, I'll change his name to protect the innocent. We'll call him Joe. And uh, we were doing some um, courseware developments. So we were creating courses that we were going to be running. This is back in the DOS Windows days. We're using a program called AmiPro, which is a, a version. It's a word processor. So he was rolling out his his you know intro to the word processor program. And what we would do is we would do a dry run through this uh, before we rolled it out to the audience. And he honestly put up there uh, a slide that said commit to print. Or sorry, commit to paper. And uh, we're all like, commit to paper? He's like, yeah, you know, print. OK, why didn't you say print? He literally said, commit to paper. Um, it's like, yeah, we're not writing novels. We're not trying to be you know, flowery here. Business writing, guys. Uh, aim is to be understood qu clearly when read quickly. Um, the other big thing, and I'm, I'm, this is my biggest challenge when it comes to writing, um, is I tend to write in a very passive voice. I like to do all the, you know, all the lead up stuff. And um, there was a uh, an article that I read around editing and writing and all that. And they used the example of in uh, the Second World War, um, 
the um, uh, the correspondence that were embedded with the troops would use the military lines of communication. And hence, back then, the lines of communication were less, uh, much lower bandwidth, uh, but also less stable than they are today. And they would also be usurped for, you know, the actual purpose that they were, which was the, um, which was the, uh, you know, military purposes. Um, but what they learned very quickly is they needed to put the beginning of the story, they need, what they call the lead, they need to put that right at the beginning because they knew that they could get maybe half of the transmission and it would be cut off. So they flipped everything around and they would put the, the meat and guts of the, the story right at the beginning, they call it the lead. Um, and I've been aiming to do that in my business writing. It's like, you know, I, I take these emails where I've, I've written three paragraphs of, you know, two setups and then the ask and I turn it into one paragraph of the ask. Now, we also need to put that within our context, you know, does the person have enough information, all that kind of stuff. But what I've been doing is instead of doing all the flowery build up in context and then the ask is I put the ask at the top and then do the all the build up and background and all that other stuff later. Finding it's pretty effective. Um, but again, do a little bit of planning, make it simple, make it clear, make it direct. Um, it is business writing after all. Now, you're also going to uh, adjust that a little bit with the type of person personality type that you're, you're dealing with. And we'll do another webinar on that in, in the future. Presentations. Oh my goodness, yes. The endless, uh, the endless presentations. Um, this is the model of three. And this actually works really, really well, both for presentations as well as for articles. I don't know if you notice this. Uh, a good business article is structured this way. It's in three parts. There's the introduction, there's the body, there's the conclusion. And what we have here is a couple of reasons why this works so well. Um, the introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them. The body, tell them, and then the conclusion is tell them what you've told them. There's, there's a couple reasons why it works. First of all, you, you actually repeat your message three times. The next which is the introduction is all about the WIFM. This is about opening the brain. This is about the invitation. Okay, I'm going to knock on the door uh, and say, hey, I want to deposit something here. And there's a, there's a bouncer at the door of your brain that says, I'm, I'm going to only let some stuff in and not others. Right, and some people refer to this as attention, um, but I want to get your attention. I want, I want, I want to grab you, right? And, and look at all those uh, LinkedIn articles that we all read, right? We see a title, we think, oh, that's interesting. You read the first paragraph, and and immediately you're saying either, yep, I want to read the rest of this, or no, I don't. And that's what the introduction's all about. The body is where the details belong. This is where you go into the details. You you take the people on that journey. The conclusion. Tell them what you've told them. This is all about helping them process that information. So again, they hear it the third time, but it also helps them process it. It helps them draw the conclusions. It helps them, you know, get to where you want them to be. It's a really good model. So last uh, question for today: Who should announce a project? So we've got a brand new project happening. Who should we be getting to announce it? There we go. All right, seeing lots of lots of responses here. Um, a, a mix of oh, Doug should be announcing. <laughs> I like that one, Doug. Um, <laughs> the official spokesperson for our project today. Um, most people looks like somewhere around ninety percent are saying sponsor. Uh, getting a couple of people saying the project manager, and then a few saying the sponsor and PM. I'm kind of liking that idea, Laura. You know, having having the two sort of working together. Um, I agree with you. It's, it's somewhere between the project manager and the sponsor, um, depending upon the structure of the company. Mm, yeah, absolutely, Julie. Uh, we do need to put that into that context for sure. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm kind of with the majority here that I I would say would be the sponsor or even potentially someone higher up the the food chain. And the reason that I say that um, is you know you've got someone who has higher um, authority, higher, you know, has the letters after their name, you know, that kind of thing um, is, yeah, totally good. And Walter, I'm loving your answer, just came in at the last minute here. Uh, project manager or the most passionate person on the project. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, this is why we call them champions because champions, um, these are folks who are passionate about the project. These are folks who want to see it, it run and succeed. So, 
yeah, totally agree. We want someone who's passionate there, but we also want someone who carries some weight. I mean, think about when you get someone who walks into your project kickoff meeting who is, you know, second or third from kind of the top of the organization. People kind of, you know, sit up and take notice, right? Um, I've shared this story before with my with my webinar uh, audience, but um, I was working at one of the banks and I had the CFO herself personally chime in and, and lend a hand and it, it was just a different environment from the day before to the day after. So manage communications. We want frequent communications. We want consistent communications. We want impactful and, and consistency is really, really key here. Um, now in all of this, uh, I was kind of looking at, you know, where can I look to see some expert communicators and, and you know, do some lessons learned and, and I really am a big fan of let's connect with people from different um, industries and, and different areas. So there's a friend of mine, Don, who works as an air traffic controller. He's actually a 19 year veteran at the Pearson uh, control tower, which is one of the biggest in the world. And I looked at that and I thought, this is interesting because there's a lot of information communicated quickly, it's communicated accurately. So we had a quick chat with Don around this and the first thing that he said is, you know what, we need to have a common language, words, phraseology. And if you've ever had a chance to listen to, and with YouTube now it's easy to do, just Google ATC, um, uh, air traffic control. Um, they have a very specific common language. You can go anywhere in the world, the language of aviation is English. And not only is it English, but there's specific wording and phraseology that we use. And this is how we have these folks with, uh, you know, English as a second language able to competently function in the cockpit, right? And this enables you to speak to both junior and senior staff. And when he said that, he's like, I talk to, you know, janitors, to, to CEOs. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, we get, you know, these six month pilots who, you know, they've just started their flight training in a Cessna 152 versus the 30 year veteran in a 747. But this phraseology and this, 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 you know, common language enables them to talk across that, that um, spread. Then we got into the conversation of dealing with exceptions. And this really surprised me, this piece. Um, the Toronto International Air Show bases a lot of the performers, including the Snowbirds, at Pearson Airport uh, during the show. Well, air traffic control starts planning for this six months ahead. And they do briefings with all stakeholders. So they talk to the, the ATC staff, they talk to the military pilots, they talk to the air show pilots, they also talk to the airline pilots. So that all of the members of this project are on board and they've, they're all on that same page and they're all talking that same language. Because military pilots, they, they do things differently than us civilian pilots do. So yeah, some kind of cool learnings there, and I'm just being cognizant of the time here. So let's uh, let's get this thing kind of wrapped up here. Uh, control of communications. It's all about making sure this is effective. Are we getting the desired results? Okay. Are we getting the effect that we want? And here are some of the barriers: too much or too little information. Right now, the too much information is information overload. Do you have enough to process, but you're not getting a whole bunch of extra stuff? Okay. So I'm not talking about the number of repetitions. I'm talking about the actual like the number of details and volumes. Um, communication skills not well developed, either the poor listener or poor writer, so you're the transmitter or the receiver. Subject matter, do you have enough in knowledge and information? Can you pick up a mic right now and, and speak to air traffic control? Most of us know. Even as a, as a pilot, I, I struggle with that. Um, you know, maybe the median isn't appropriate for that audience or the technology isn't working really well. You know, those sorts of things. So some key points here to just finish off our, our time together today. Communicate in their terms. This is the whole what's in it for, for them. Um, talk to your people in terms of the receiver, not the transmitter. Uh, communicate when it's imp or what's important to them. Okay, so again, putting it in their terms. Uh, use their favorite medium and communicate lots. And the recommendation is about seven to 14 times. And again, it's gonna be spaced over time. So this isn't, you know, once a day type thing. And heck, if it ain't working, change it, do something different. So I opened with this question, what key learning or relearning nugget do you want to walk away with? We had some really good responses there. I'm, I'm hoping that you're able to get a few. Um, couldn't do a communication session without having a little bit of fun here. This is a favorite one of mine, big Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin and Hobbes fan. Calvin, quick chasing around the house. Crash Bang said, what did I just tell you? Beats me. Weren't you listening either? It's been a bit of a standard at our house. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, you know, if it's not being received, all right. Okay, um, so that's it for today. I will stay on the line for a bit. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to type in. My email is there. Um, the code, uh, pmka-com. We'll see you next month. Um, 
Jess will be sending out the uh, recording as well as the invite for the next session, which I think is on risk, if I remember correctly. Beautiful. We'll see you next time, folks.